power of the image was out there. People knew, and it was seductive. Here's to the ladies, the fair and the weak. But who dares call them weak? Our modern girls play as hard and with as much vitality and stamina as any man. By the late 1930s, we had the outbreak of World War II, and there you see a breakdown in the fashion chain. American fashion really comes onto the map with the shutdown of the French couture. Casual wear was popular here, so a new type of model, the all-American scrubbed clean beauties, long-haired, healthy, athletic, that comes into vogue. Already a few teenage models rank as full-fledged cover girls. Their faces familiar from coast to coast in advertisements and on magazine covers. Paralleling that, Dior unleashes the new look on the world, and in comes hyper-stylized fashion. If you look at the gestures the women have, this is almost contortionist, and yet there's an imperious haughtiness in her face, which shows no effort at all. That's very important. You were bulletproof. And along came a Frenchman, and down came the hemlines. The new look was here, dreamed up by a newcomer on the fashion scene named Christian Dior. Small thanks he got from the boys. In 1949, Dorian Lee modeled this beautiful Robert Piguet dress, and you can see that her body has taken on that very refined, elegant sense of feminine extremity. Women's very physicality was transformed by Christian Dior's vision. A great new allied industry has grown up in the U.S. over the past 25 years. The model business. Around the 50s, I think, is when the efforts of people like Eileen Ford began really structuring modeling as an industry. It's really at the time where the first generation of true agents happened. Fisher felt that her best bet was the Conover Agency, which specializes in wholesome, unsophisticated types. She could never hope to scale the professional heights attained by famed fashion model Lisa Fonsagreve, whose hourly rate is often as high as $40. In 1955, Richard Avedon shot Dovima, one of the greatest, most sophisticated models of the 1950s, with the elephants. What's extraordinary about this is that this is the Saint Laurent first collection for Christian Dior. So it's really an icon of fashion history. You still look at those photos, and they're so gorgeous, and they're so aspirational, mm -hmm. and you still want to wear those clothes. It's very glamorous, but it's very steady. You know, it's the big hat, it's the gloves. It's the waist. It's the razor cut. It's Dior's new Look, it's a very particular kind of fashion. What the nation's press and the mass circulation magazines report on the season's fashions, whether from Hollywood or New York, soon becomes gospel. Women in every whistle stop or Midland suburb are as up to date on American style as most of their urban sisters. I remember that. You had those little hats with the half veils. You know, it set it on like a hairband with some little flowers. The hair was really set and small. And you had button earrings. Everything was like buttoned up. So as a girl, for my mother, I saw that there was no room for individuality. If you didn't conform, you were ostracized. <laughs> Though a Paris label still carries great prestige, big names in the world of fashion have emerged across the Atlantic. You had American models going over and lighting up the French couture. It's a really exciting dynamic. Susie, Jean Patchett, Dorian, all of them went right over. Intensely overcrowded and overpublicized, modeling is a hazardous field in which new faces constantly replace old. Boundaries began to be broken all over the place, but not only in fashion. 